Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Geneva. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, press briefing. Uh, my name is Sony Consul. I'm the head of communications here at uh, IATA, uh, and I'm joined by our Director General, Willie Walsh. Um, we have a short presentation on sort of latest situation of the industry and a few remarks from Willie, uh, and then we'll throw it open to questions via the chat function. Um, so to get us started, Willie, did you want to take us through a, a briefing as to what this current state of the industry is? Thank you, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a short presentation, as Tony said, uh, to take you through the most recent traffic data release for October 2021. So if we go to the first slide, thank you. Uh, once again, you, you can see that air cargo is performing well. Um, in October, it was 9% ahead of uh, October 2019. So a very good performance, and in fact, year to date uh, to the end of October versus the same period in 2019, it's it's running at 9% ahead on a yearly basis as well. So cargo continues to uh, perform very well. Uh, a lot of that comes from uh, additional freighter activity because as we've mentioned previously, uh, the belly hold activity is still uh, disrupted as a result of the challenges with international travel, uh, particularly on the wide body long haul, where a lot of uh, restrictions are preventing passenger traffic, uh, but some of those aircraft are operating uh, to carry uh, air cargo. So um, good performance from the cargo side of the business. If we look at domestic, uh, again, the same sort of trend continues there. In October, down 22% year to date, it's down 29% versus the same period in 2019. And international, uh, we're, we're seeing it uh, recover, but uh, it's a slow uh, slog, really. 65% uh, down in October, year to date, down about 79%. Uh, so the challenge there continues to be the uh, problems caused by government restrictions on travel, border closures, testing requirements, which is uh, suppressing the uh, demand. Uh, and again, we continue to see evidence that where these restrictions are removed, demand returns pretty quickly. Uh, overall, the industry for October was uh, 49.4% down on where it was in 2019. So. I think that's the first time we've uh, moved above the 50% mark um, and year to date we're about 61% down. And if you look at the uh, next slide, please. Uh, the domestic markets, um, it continues to be a, a, you know, quite a mixed bag there. We've got Russia uh, running at 24% ahead of where it was in 2019 and Australia 81% behind where it was. In 2019, the US is at minus 10.5%. Uh, Interestingly, one not shown on this is the uh, European domestic markets, which are performing reasonably well at 7.5% uh, below where they were in 2019. And again, this just reinforces what we've been saying that where people can travel without restriction, there's a good underlying demand. And we move on next slide, which looks at the international uh, performance. This really does highlight the uh, the border closures. Uh, so the uh, best performing uh, part of the network is North America to Central America, uh, down just over 9% uh, within Europe. So international across borders within Europe is uh, down 36%. But then you look at the, the bottom of the chart there um, within Asia, 97% uh, down on 2019, and it's completely flatlined. There's there's no movement on on that at all. So the uh, the major problem here uh, continues to be the uh, restrictions on cross border travel, which is uh, suppressing the uh, demand. Uh, but uh, you know we were encouraged by what we were seeing in uh, Europe as travel restrictions uh, started to relax. Clearly. November will uh, show a slightly different picture, and then uh, December, with uh, all of the recent events, uh, will uh, be disrupted again. And if I move on just to, so these are the the uh, traffic um, data that we look at. If we look at the schedule data, uh, so looking uh, slightly ahead, you can see that airlines are adding uh, capacity, uh, both in the domestic and international. However, what we have seen recently is some very short term 
reductions in capacity uh, following the uh, new travel restrictions that were introduced recently. So, uh, you know, prior to this latest variant, we were seeing greater confidence in the industry supported by uh, an improving um, situation with passenger traffic. Uh, and we were seeing airlines respond by uh, returning capacity into the market. Uh, I think that's the intention of airlines as we go forward. Uh, hopefully this will be a, a short term uh, disruption as uh, governments recognize that these restrictions are, are ineffective and I'll comment on that in, in a moment. And the next slide uh, just shows uh, some booking data, which would at this stage indicate that uh, November international uh, travel performance should show a, a slight improvement on where we were in October, uh, but domestic is likely to show a, a slight uh, decline. But overall, you know, when we can take restrictions out of the market and allow people to travel, um, there is good demand there and certainly improving uh, demand once people get comfortable uh, with the requirements of uh, international travel. And uh, I've one final slide which deals with this issue of uh, travel restrictions. Uh, and what we did here is we, we plotted the um, travel restrictions on a sort of weighted average basis across all of the regions in the red line there and the, uh, um, the number of infections. And quite honestly, you know, it, it says here the impact of travel restrictions on cases is unclear. I, I would go a bit further than that. I would say there's no correlation between the introduction of these uh, restrictions and the um, the effect that it's having on the transmission of the virus. Uh, and again, I, I would point to the UK. Uh, don't mean to keep picking on them, but they give us plenty of uh, stuff to uh, allow us to pick on them. Uh, you know, when they introduced the uh, travel restrictions back on the 22nd of May of 2020, so 18 months ago when they first introduced these uh, restrictions, they said they were doing so to prevent a second wave uh, at the time uh, of introducing them. Uh, on that same day, there are 254,000 infections reported in uh, are recorded in the UK since the start of the pandemic. So 254,000 on the 22nd of May, and it's 10.6 million today. So, you know, there, there's no evidence of uh, restrictions suppressing the transmission of the virus. And again, if you go to the data from the UK, as you've heard me quote before, all of the people required to do PCR testing when they arrived in the UK, uh, the positivity rate amongst that group was 0.8%, while at the very same time, the, the positivity rate in the uh, general population, again, based on the PCR testing, so like for like, was over 8%, 8.3%. So, um, you know, we're very clear that uh, these measures do not achieve the stated objective. And in fact, we're, I think, supported on this by statements from the WHO and the ECDC. Uh, and I'm just going to read uh, some of these comments because I, I think they are worth reflecting on. And uh, what the WHO is saying, you know, that blanket travel bans will not prevent the international spread and they place a heavy burden on lives and livelihoods. In addition, they can adversely impact global health efforts during the pandemic by disincentivizing countries to report and share epidemiological and sequencing data. All countries should ensure that the measures are regularly reviewed and updated when new evidence becomes available. Uh, and that's the that's the case, uh, supported again by uh, the ECDC, uh, which says pretty much the same thing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the best thing governments can do here is to look and assess the, the risk based on the data and make decisions based on that. But it's clear to us that, you know, the travel industry and airlines in particular are being used as the poster child to transmit fear, uh, you know, to, 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 to transmit the messages that governments want to uh, force people to continue to restrict their movements you know, to uh, comply with all of the COVID requirements. It's not because there's a uh, a threat caused by uh, aviation, but it's merely 
uh, to be able to demonstrate that uh, you know there is a, a threat out there and by hammering the airline industry they think they're sending a strong powerful message to the uh, general um, population uh, to get them to comply with the uh, restrictions but it's doing huge damage to the airline industry and to tourism industry and to, uh, global economies and it's doing huge damage to people who have been unable to travel to connect with their family connect with friends travel for business uh, and really the, the you know the, the time is well past when governments can look at the risk associated with international travel and look at the general risk to the population uh, and start focusing on the areas that need to be focused on because the risk is definitely not coming from uh, aviation the risk is in the community and uh, the sooner governments actually start targeting that and recognizing that uh, you know we are going to have more of these variants uh, i'm not a scientist but every scientist i've listened to explains that this is the natural development of a virus uh, you know we are going to have more of them we can't keep shutting down aviation and shutting down economies uh, you know when in reality uh, it's not uh, providing any um, measures to restrict the transmission of the virus and more importantly uh, it's doing huge damage to the industry. So I'll pause at that and turn back to Tony when we can take your questions. Great, thank you very much, Willie. Um, we've got actually quite a few questions in the queue. Um, and I guess the first area that uh, people are asking about is, do we have any assessment of the impact of these new measures that governments have introduced uh, in respect of Omicron? Uh, not at this stage. I think it's still too early. Um, anecdotally, it is uh, impacting on passenger traffic. Uh, the restrictions and the, the new testing is having uh, uh, creating a lot of confusion in the market. I, I traveled myself from Dublin to Switzerland uh, yesterday. Um, the flights uh, had, uh, you know, not many people on board, but a, a lot of people uh, who turned up for the flight couldn't get on because they hadn't done a PCR test in Ireland, which is now the requirement that the Swiss authorities have introduced. I've heard similar stories in other parts of the world where these new requirements for testing have been introduced at short notice. Uh, people haven't been able to comply with them or haven't understood that the rules have changed uh, and it's causing great confusion. And I think that is causing a suppression of demand because once people experience that confusion you know turn up at a uh, at an airport to take a flight that they believe they've uh, met all the requirements to get on board and then are told sorry you, you know you should have done a, a pcr test and instead of a rapid antigen test and I, i'll be honest the, the only reason i was able to get on the flight is uh, uh, i didn't know what was going to happen so uh, i i took a pcr test when i arrived in dublin so i'd done one um, had i not done that i wouldn't have been able to get a pcr uh, in time to take the return flight. So anecdotally, it's clearly having an impact on traffic. Uh, I think all of us are optimistic that governments will quickly review these restrictions and recognize based on the information that's available to us now that uh, the risk is uh, no more significant than it was be before this variant was identified and the restrictions uh, hopefully will be removed and that's the critical message you know governments are quick to put these restrictions in place they believe they're doing it for the right reason or at least they argue they're doing it for the right reason but when that reason is gone or no longer valid uh, then you know they should remove the restriction unfortunately we've seen them uh, very slow to do so and uh, i think it's it's time now that uh, governments are honest with people, uh, they do introduce restrictions. They should be introduced for the right reason. Uh, when that reason is addressed, they should be removed. OK, thank you very much. Um, we have a question about um, the EU. Um, yeah, I suppose it would be the EU travel pass um, or the green pass. Uh, and the question is asking about the recognition of booster vaccinations in the um, in these sort of traveler credentials. And I guess maybe we can answer it in two ways. One would be uh, first, is it a priority to get them recognized? And secondly, I suppose, how does the IATA travel pass uh, deal with that? 
Yeah, well, the IATA travel pass can deal with that. Uh, you know, we're um, going live with a number of airlines now. As as we had seen international travel begin to pick up, and as I had mentioned previously, the IATA travel pass will be critical once international passenger numbers start increasing, because that will put significant pressure on airports. So uh, working with uh, some of our partner airlines, we've been able to adapt to changing requirements uh, and to test how quickly we can introduce a, any of these new requirements. So uh, the team are confident that they can deal with any of these changes in a in a, in a, in a very quick way. Um, I, I think getting recognition of these boosters is important. We had seen great progress and we gave credit to the EU for the development of the EU DCC, uh, which was not only adopted by the 27 EU countries, but by a further 23, 24 other countries. Um, so, you know, we, we have a system that works uh, uh, and it has been, you know, well adopted. Uh, we would encourage more governments to look at either mutual recognition or to adopt the EU uh, system, which, uh, as I say, is, is quite simple and, and very effective. Uh, but once the requirements changed, uh, the systems can be changed reasonably quickly and certainly the IATA travel pass can be adopted uh, and adapted. Uh, to address any of these changes. OK, thanks, Willie. Um, we have a question about uh, testing requirements, um, and I know you've spoken a lot about the, the cost of PCR testing. The, the questioner is asking, um, how much does uh, the cost of testing add to a trip, and to what extent is that a disincentive for people to travel? Well, it's a huge disincentive, and of course it depends on the price you're, you're paying, but uh, you know, we, we've seen previously um, when we did a, re a review of this dealing with 16 countries, the cost ranging from zero in France at the time to 278 US dollars in Tokyo um, for the same test. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, wide range of uh, costs uh, across the, the network today. Um, and, and what is terrible for consumers is uh, there's clear evidence that they're being ripped off here. Um, you know, very, very clear. Uh, again, I'll pick on the UK because, uh, you know, the UK government publishes a long list of suppliers who will provide the test. They advertise prices starting at, uh, you know, around one pound. You have no hope in hell of finding one for, for that price. Uh, it does need to be regulated and it needs to be controlled. Uh, and particularly when you have these restrictions now where um, the uh, test is uh, required to release you from quarantine in the UK, for example. You know, we can't tolerate a situation as had existed where tests were arriving late, uh, results were being sent on time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think governments need to be fair to their citizens and to consumers around the world. Uh, they should not allow this industry to uh, rip off people in the way they have, uh, given that the requirement that they've introduced is based on public health guidelines. And you know that being the case, uh, then you know we strongly believe that they should follow uh, WHO guidelines and provide the testing free of charge. Uh, uh, you know, if, if not to do it at a, a nominal charge that covers the actual cost of the test, which is nowhere close to what some people are being charged uh, for for tests, uh, you know, across the world. So this is an area if these testing requirements are to remain in place that needs to be uh, regulated and competition authorities should have already addressed this and, and use their powers to uh, to protect consumers who are being forced to undertake expensive tests, poor quality of service, and in some cases not even getting uh, the tests that they have uh, paid for. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question from Asia. Um, and the questioner uh, notes that you said that uh, intra-Asia travel is basically flatlining. Um, and they're asking, what is that related to? Is that primarily the effect of China and India having restrictions, or is it more broad than that? Yeah, it's it's more broad than that. Um, you know, there, there are uh, quite a number of countries in Asia who have uh, travel restrictions, uh, and it is uh, impacting um, significantly on both uh, domestic, actually, uh, markets, intra-Asia markets, and Asia to other parts of the world. I was just looking so from uh, Asia to um, let me check here where we have. Uh, Asia to North America, 
for example, it's down 91%. Uh, year to date, it's down 89. So it principally relates to the border closures in Asia. Uh, and we've seen, um, you know, similar figures for, for other markets. So it's not just down to one or two countries. It's, it's down to uh, quite a number of countries in the region who have had uh, border closures or significant restrictions on people traveling there. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, it's, it's completely flatlined. We've seen no movement the, within Asia. Travel of uh, down almost 98% uh, is, uh, you know, an indication of, uh, of uh, you know, the full suppression of demand uh, because there's no doubt that if those restrictions were removed, there would be a lot of demand in that region. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question about onboard transmission. Um, and the questioner says, uh, is there a need to update studies on onboard transmission given the emergence of the new variants um, and the industry's reliance on these sort of dated studies or studies that have at least predate uh, some of the variants that have emerged? Yeah, well, the, the first thing I say is there could be variants all the time. So, you know, I, I don't think we should become fixated on the outbreak of this variant. Uh, you know, what scientists tell us, um, and I've certainly spoken to a lot of them in, in recent weeks, is that, uh, you know, viruses mutate. In fact, you know, that was what they were saying to us when this uh, virus first uh, appeared, uh, and that generally, you know, the virus tries to stay alive and it mutates to do so. And if it follows the natural evolution of a virus, it uh, does become sort of more infectious, more transmissible, but less uh, in, less of an impact on, on the, uh, the host. And I'll go back. I was just looking earlier, actually, uh, to a report by Reuters on the 25th of September of this year, so not that long ago. Uh, and it quoted Patrick Key, I think it was, uh, of IASA, who said that there were only seven passengers out of three million on flights in recent weeks which showed symptoms of the, the virus. Uh, risks are highly controlled and very marginal. And I, and I think that's still the case. You know, there were a lot of studies done into the transmission on board the aircraft. And for several uh, reasons, it's well recognized uh, that the, the risk on board the aircraft is uh, actually significantly lower than in most other places where you'll, you'll find people, uh, you know, down to the fact that the air is filtered uh, with very effective HEPA filters, the airflow is vertical rather than horizontal, and the air is fully refreshed every two to three minutes. Uh, so we're not concerned about what happens on board the aircraft. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, um, that's something that has been tested, and I'm sure will continue to be tested. But I don't believe that the uh, evidence and the data that we've seen uh, before this variant um, is going to change that. Great, thank you very much, Willie. Um, we have a question asking about the impact of uh, the reaction to Omicron. And the question basically is asking, do, do you think this could uh, cause airlines to ask governments for more state aid? Are they uh, going to be able to survive this without going bankrupt, et cetera? So how concerned are you about um, the financial state of the industry? Well, I think where governments impose restrictions and prevent airlines from flying, uh, you know, so actually stop them from operating, as we're seeing here. In fact, I've got to give great credit to airline management teams dealing with this in, in recent weeks, continuing to uh, transport uh, people, despite the fact that uh, in a lot of cases, the uh, demand be, uh, has uh, significantly reduced because people have cancelled their uh, flights because of these uh, new restrictions, fear of having to uh, quarantine. Now, in, in most cases, those quarantine requirements have been removed. Uh, so, for example, Switzerland had introduced 10 day quarantine uh, for a list of over 30 countries. Uh, I think to their credit, they recognized that that was uh, going too far and uh, removed the quarantine requirement after a few days. They still have what I think are, um, you know, requirements for testing that go way beyond what is necessary. Um, so uh, I, I think where governments impose these restrictions and say they're doing so in the uh, interest of uh, public health, well, then airlines are justified in, in looking to uh, governments to uh, provide support in the same way as governments are supporting you know, other sectors of the economy when they're forced to uh, close. So there's been no specific support in many cases uh, for aviation. Some countries have been very good recognizing the uh, critical economic 
um, and, and long term strategic importance of their industry, but others have not. But I think where these restrictions uh, uh, prevent people from operating, then it's uh, perfectly justifiable to go and uh, look for financial support. I still am optimistic that this will be a short term uh, issue uh, because it's clear to everybody the evidence that's becoming available to us is more positive than maybe people had believed, you know. And let's be honest, uh, you know, the scare was the because of the knee jerk reaction of governments who, you know, took action based on no evidence. In fact, you know, they just ignored the evidence and uh, decided to impose these restrictions without understanding whether it would have any positive impact. And it's clear from all of the data, they don't have positive impact. Closing your borders after the virus is inside your country is not going to achieve anything. And that's that's what the science is telling us. Uh, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll watch this carefully, but I, I think we have to push back, challenge governments as to why these restrictions are introduced and challenge them on the basis of data and science, not on the basis of anecdote or on the basis of fear, but on the basis of, uh, you know, prove to us that this is going to make a difference because all of the evidence we have, and there's a lot of it available now, shows that these measures have not been effective. In fact, you know, have, have not done anything to uh, suppress the transmission of the virus because the virus was in the country. OK, um, just on that, uh, Willie, we have a, a question ref referencing back to your comment that the risk is not in aviation, it's in the community. Um, and the questioner says, but the spreading of Omicron must have started somewhere. There were 14 cases on two recent KLM flights uh, two weeks ago. How can you exclude aviation from being a risk? Well, it's not just aviation then, you know, so let's stop people traveling by car, by bus, by train, by boat. Let's stop people walking, cycling, moving. Let's lock everybody in their houses if that's what you want, you know, because th these variants can uh, appear anywhere. Uh, and that's that's the reality. We will have more variants. We don't know where they're going to appear. And as the WHO says, don't penalize the countries that find them, uh, which is what is happening. So South Africa has been hammered economically. Uh, because they have the, the benefit of being able to test and sequence. Uh, so, you know, we have to learn to live with this virus. That's what the scientists are telling us. Uh, you know, take sensible measures. They take effective measures, which, you know, principally uh, revolve around the um, uh, vaccinations, which again uh, appear to be effective against this uh, variant. Uh, you know, so what we need is for more of the world to be vaccinated. You know, the idea that I think Africa is still only uh, around seven and a half percent, you know, fully vaccinated. You know, we, we need to be doing more to get more people vaccinated. That's what's going to give us the, the, the greatest benefit. Uh, so, um, you know, the idea that somehow you won't have variants if uh, there's no flights is complete nonsense. Uh, you're going to get variants and, and they're going to transmit in the community. And, uh, you know, the idea that if you, you know, shut down your country, that the, the virus will disappear. It's not, uh, you know, the, the virus is still there. The virus is looking for opportunities to mutate and find a new host. And that's what's going to happen. So, you know, we can't shut down everything when a new variant appears. Uh, we're going to have to continue to uh, encourage the uh, development of the science, um, development of antiviral uh, drugs, which uh, I believe will represent a, another a very positive benefit to the uh, global population and uh, continue to support one another when it comes to vaccinations. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question uh, looking towards the year end, and the questioner asks whether the travel restrictions that have put in, put in, put in place for Omicron will uh, impact the Christmas holiday season or do you think it will be over before then and people will be confident enough to travel? And a second part of that is, if not, then how long do you expect uh, the paralysis to continue? Well, I'd, I'd like to think uh, again, based on all of the data that's uh, available to the governments and decision makers that uh, these restrictions will be removed and people will be able to uh, get back to their travel plans as they had intended to do. Um, it's too early to say whether it's going to impact on the uh, traditional holiday travel plans. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there are still people flying 
Um, and there are uh, lots of people who are very comfortable to fly. Uh, and maybe I would go back and suggest that, uh, you know, the the arguments that we made early on in this, whereas, you know, where the role of government is to provide data, uh, to provide um, information and to allow individuals to make their decisions uh, based on their own risk appetite. Uh, as I said, uh, I've had no hesitation in flying. I, I look at all of the data, like many of you, uh, I probably looked at more data points than a lot of people, but you know, based on on the data that's available to me and listening to uh, you know the experts in this area, uh, I'm comfortable taking a decision that uh, you know I will continue to travel, and that that's what I intend to do. Uh, and I think the same would be true of a lot of people if they were allowed the freedom to make that decision. In the same ways, we're allowed freedom to make other decisions that impact on our health. Um, yeah, I don't want to live in a world where uh, government's going to make all of my uh, health based decisions. Um, you know, so I've had two PCRs, two lateral flow tests and three pints of Guinness in the last seven days. Uh, you know, I prefer to be able to continue to drink the Guinness and drop taking the PCR test. But, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm sure Guinness is good for you. That's what they will say. But, uh, you know, we, we take decisions ourselves. So people still smoke, people still drink, people are uh, eating too much. Um, but, you know, that's that's their personal decision. And, and we should be allowed based on the data, based on proper uh, evidence based information, make decisions as to what it is we want to do. OK, thanks, Willie. Um, we have a question um, asking about our, our uh, friends in the industry, the airports. Um, and the questioner says that airports too are bleeding. Um, is IATA concerned uh, that this could affect business for the airlines? Not at all. No, um, a bleeding airport is uh, music to my ears uh, because quite honestly, you know, they, OK, maybe I'm being unfair. There are some good airports out there, but the behavior of airports, uh, you know, principally the ones we've called out, and it's not just Heathrow, but they, you know, they continue to shock everybody with you know their demand for a, a 90 90 percent increase in airport charges uh, at a time when the uh, industry is trying to get back on uh, their feet you know we've got amsterdam we've got airports in india we've got uh, airports in south africa you know all of them looking to ramp up their um, costs believing that that's going to be helpful to the industry it clearly isn't uh, so i have sympathy for some of the smaller uh, regional airports uh, where there is genuine competition, um, but for most of these big uh, quasi monopoly or monopoly uh, airports, I, I don't have uh, sympathy for them. You know, we're, we're, airlines have had to take very drastic measures uh, to ensure that they have survived. Uh, airlines have pretty much all gone to their shareholders to look for additional uh, support. Um, I think there's a, a lot that airports could do. Uh, you know, rather than going to their customers, I, I think uh, many of these airports that have looked to raise increases should go to their shareholders uh, to to look for support uh, rather than uh, try to impose these massive increase on uh, the airline industry. OK, thank you. Um, Willie, earlier you mentioned uh, vaccinations. We have a question that follows up on that by asking what our position is on making vaccinations mandatory for airline industry employees uh, or for passengers. No, we, we've not um, come to a position on mandatory vaccination. What we do believe is that airline employees should be prioritized uh, for vaccination. I, I know that transport workers, in fact, uh, we met with the WHO and the ILO, uh, a group representing uh, the trucking industry, the shipping industry and the uh, trade uh, union um, movement. So airlines, truckers, uh, shippers, uh, uh, shipping uh, to argue that, uh, you know, uh, airline employees should be free to go about their work without uh, these um, very restrictive measures that some countries have introduced. I, and given that they, you know these uh, workers have to cross borders, they should be prioritised when it comes to the distribution of vaccines. Uh, but at this point, uh, you know where governments mandate uh, vaccines, that's fine. But uh, you know we've not taken a view that uh, the industry should uh, mandate vaccines for 
our employees or our customers. And that's principally because many of our customers and indeed many of uh, our employees around the world can't get access uh, to vaccines. Uh, so, you know, mandating something that isn't available is definitely not the right way forward. OK, uh, thanks, Willie. Um, we have a follow up question uh, on airport charges uh, with specific reference to Poland, which has announced some hefty uh, proposals to hike fees, and they're asking whether that will impact ticket prices, how that will um, impact perhaps the overall recovery of demand in the local market. Yeah, so anybody who listens to an airport and uh, is Cons by the idea that airport charges are insignificant. You really needs to to look at uh, you know the the nature of this industry. If if our costs increase, if airport charges go up, uh, ultimately the consumer is going to have to pay for that because airlines are not in a position to absorb those costs, particularly in the environment we're operating in at the moment. Uh, you know, in the best decade of this industry's history, uh, which was uh, up in you know, 2010 to 2019, uh, the um, operating margin for the industry from memory was 5.5% in that decade. And that was the best uh, we had done in the previous decade, I think it was 0.7%. So, you know, we, we have to um, keep costs under control and uh, airports are far too quick to say, you know, we're only a little part of uh, uh, the ticket price, that's that's not true. Uh, they're a significant part. Every cost is a significant part and every cent that they add to their airport charges, you know, adds to the cost base of the airline and ultimately will add to the price of tickets. And, and you know, that will get to a point where uh, it will suppress demand uh, because a lot of people who travel are very price sensitive. Uh, and, and Poland in particular, the, you know, the market there uh, it consists of a, a very um, big element of price sensitive travelers. So, you know, if the Polish airports start increasing prices, it will ultimately see its way through into ticket prices, and that's likely to suppress demand for travel in Poland. Okay, uh, thanks, Willie. Um, we've been talking a lot about specific travel restrictions, but we have a question uh, that's talking about other um, measures that governments implement in society, for example, requirement to work from home. Sorry, requirement to work from home. Um, do you think that those types of measures also reduce the appetite for travel? No, in fact, we have some evidence to suggest that those other measures are increasing the uh, appetite uh, to travel because uh, people have more flexibility in how they work and therefore have more freedom uh, to travel. And that's uh, something that uh, we've done a bit of research on and the propensity to travel in that environment is uh, likely to increase. We've, we've also seen evidence where in a lot of uh, countries um, people have saved money through this period, uh, you know, and some of it is because they have not been able to spend their money, uh, but there is pent up demand. Uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about uh, other policies, particularly things like flexible working where Actually, I think flexible working will represent uh, an opportunity for the uh, the airline industry once we can uh, facilitate uh, travel without all of these restrictions. Okay. Um, we have a questioner who's, I guess, reflecting on the fact that we're calling on governments to coordinate. We're calling on governments to follow what the WHO is doing. But aside from that, um, what can the industry do to try and affect change in the way that the system works? Is there a possibility they're suggesting to work with WHO to have a, a prevention mechanism or so, something a bit more forceful than just advice? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, clearly we would like to work uh, with the WHO. Uh, as I said, we had a very uh, good dialogue with the, uh, uh, the WHO and we will uh, continue to engage uh, with them. Um, and I, I think there are opportunities for us uh, to work together and to support one another. Um, I know that many of the things we have said uh, they would uh, agree with because we've argued for a risk based uh, approach to um, travel and to restrictions. Uh, I think it's easier for me to say that maybe than it is for WHO, but and principally because in the airline industry, we deal with risk all the time. That's the nature of our business. We're comfortable assessing risk. You know, we're good at assessing risk. We're good at identifying mitigating actions to uh, reduce 
uh, the net risk and we do that all the time and we're also good at being held accountable um, because the, you know that's the nature of our business as well uh, you know politics tends to be uh, you know different where you know politicians don't feel comfortable dealing with risk don't like being held accountable uh, you know don't like um, uh, being challenged uh, so uh, you know we would like to uh, work with uh, governments and, and uh, health agencies and let's be honest we have to learn from this experience the idea that you know the world does not learn from what we've gone through over the past uh, 22 months uh, I, I think that's just completely unacceptable we must learn and we must do better next time around uh, you know and there have been a lot of positives out of this the development of a vaccine in such a short period of time has been a, a real positive but understanding that that vaccine needs to be distributed right across the world, uh, that message still hasn't landed, uh, you know, sufficiently well to see uh, the uh, rates of vaccination um, more equitable across the world. You know, it's not good enough that we can vaccinate some countries and leave other countries completely unvaccinated. So we, you know, we have to deal with a global problem through global uh, cooperation and global methods and. Uh, you know, we need to see greater cooperation between um, governments. We need to see people listen to the health experts. That's what the WHO is there for. They've done a fantastic job uh, in previous um, uh, epidemics. Uh, and, I, I, you know, had we listened to their advice and acted on their advice, I've no doubt that the, the situation we face today would uh, be uh, an awful lot better. So, uh, you know, we, we want to work with others uh, and we're prepared to work with others, others. But where we see bad behavior and where we see, um, you know, governments taking steps that are not justified and not supported by the data, uh, then, you know, we're, we will continue to call them out. Um, thanks, Willie. We have a, a question about uh, consumer reaction. So uh, when the Delta variant appeared, uh, there was an almost immediate impact on forward bookings. Um, do you it's a bit early still to tell if that's the case with omicron but would you expect that passengers are getting more accustomed to to these types of announcements and more used to um maybe less knee-jerk in their reaction or do you think they're reacting in the same way as governments very quickly uh, that, that's a great question and my strong belief is that consumers uh, are getting used to it much more quickly than governments are you know what uh, consumers are uh, disrupted by uh, the knee-jerk um, reactions of governments, not news of the the variants. You know, we've all become experts in in variants and uh, viruses. Uh, you know, we've all known um, that there would be new variants discovered. Uh, you know, we've all waited for them, and you know, we're just waiting for what they're going to call it. Uh, but you know, I I think I think the consumer is uh, much more. Uh, savvy that maybe uh, governments give them credit for. And that's why I say, you know, go back to a situation whereby governments give us the information, uh, governments provide us with the data, governments provide us with help to make an informed decision, and that we then as individuals, uh, based on our own risk uh, appetites, can take a decision as to what it is we want to do. And some people will decide they don't want to travel, and, and others will decide that they do. And uh, I believe that that's uh, what should be allowed. Okay, um, we have a question about uh, sort of expectation on travel restrictions in the EU. Do you think um, things will get better from now and governments will start to review or do you expect that we'll see more restrictions coming in place as we've seen in some other countries like the UK, for example? Well, I, I think governments will have to justify why they're not reviewing um, because, you know, you, you take a decision based on no data, which is in effect what, you know, some of these governments said, we don't know what we're dealing with, we're gonna shut the borders. Uh, you know, data then becomes available. Now you know what you're dealing with. So you no longer can justify the knee jerk reaction that uh, you took when uh, news of this first came out. Uh, you need to uh, assess it based on the data you have and, you know, the risk associated with it. and. Uh, um, that's that's what we would and should demand of, of governments that they, uh, you know, review these restrictions and remove them. Why, why should we tolerate having our lives restricted when there's no reason 
for those restrictions to be in place. So when the evidence says the, the need for restriction is gone, you know, the restriction should be removed. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question uh, referencing back to some comments you made about domestic markets. Um, you suggested that in November uh, there would be a downturn in domestic markets. Is that primarily uh, changes in domestic China market in response to various virus outbreaks, or do you see a more broad uh, issue in domestic markets? It's uh, in relation to uh, yeah a couple of domestic markets. So you know Japan, um, where uh, the Japanese domestic market had been uh, recovering. Um, if I can find it here. We were yeah. So uh, year to date, Japan was at uh, minus sixty two, whereas in uh, in October it was minus 49. So you can see the Japanese market had been picking up, but I, I think uh, we're likely to see some restrictions there potentially in China. Uh, so, um, you know, that it's it's too early to say, but I, I think that's likely to be the case that in, in some of the countries where we had seen uh, steady domestic uh, uh, traffic or growing domestic uh, traffic, I think that may uh, just take a little bit of a hit. Um, but, you know, Russia continues to be very strong. Uh, I suspect, uh, you know, prior to this variant, we would have seen improving domestic figures out of Australia, and I fully expect to see that again. Um, I think the situation in Australia is likely to be temporary. So it, there'll be swings and roundabouts, uh, but it's just based on a quick snapshot of uh, the uh, data that we have. I, I don't think it tells us too much at this point. Okay. Um, we have a question about some of the announcements that governments have made about on arrival testing. Um, so in some cases where that testing is being proposed potentially for the airport location, um, does IATA have any concerns about that? Are we working with others uh, to try and find uh, alternatives so that we don't have crowding uh, around these ch uh, choke points in airports for on arrival testing or presumably also document checks? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, airports aren't built, uh, aren't designed to, to cope with this, and we need to be very careful. You know, if there's genuine concern about transmission uh, because people are close to one another, all you have to do is look at the images of some of these airports where people are piled up on top of one another as they wait to uh, get their documents checked. So uh, I think we need to be realistic. You know, it, it, most airports would not, would not be capable of dealing with uh, high volumes of uh, on arrival uh, testing. Many airports today do have uh, testing facilities on site or, or nearby, um, and, and that's that's good for consumers to have that option. But it, you know, there isn't sufficient uh, uh, capacity there to deal with everybody who's arriving, and, and that's just going to create uh, new bottlenecks in the system that uh, clearly would uh, increase risk rather than reduce risk. Okay. Um, we have a specific question on the UK. Um, and the questioner says the initial response uh, by the UK government was somewhat measured and then uh, explicitly ruled out requiring pre-departure tests. Um, now they seem to be doing an about turn. Um, what do you think is behind the government's um, change and change, uh, the questioner says, even with the opposition of its own MPs? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm surprised to say somewhat measured. I wouldn't have described the UK action as being somewhat measured. They were the first to sort of get out there and start banning people, uh, reintroducing the red list. Um, you know, the the UK, um, quite honestly, I, I, I've given up trying to understand what they do. You know, the, the traffic light system where you have six different lights on the traffic light, uh, uh, you know, it, it, everything they've done um, has been ridiculed, and uh, I don't think they were measured in their response. Uh, you know, they have reintroduced uh, the requirement to do on um, day two or you know day two uh, PCR tests for people who are vaccinated, um, and now you are required to quarantine until you get the result of, of that. So that to me is. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a measured response, and then the pre-departure uh, check as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I I don't and I can't explain why they do these because uh, you know it, it isn't supported by the data. As I said, go back and just look at the data yourself for the UK. Uh, I suppose the, the benefit there is we do have a lot of data. 
Um, but, you know, the positivity rate for people flying into the country, 0.8 percent uh, with all of these restrictions. Expensive PCR testing, 9.6 million PCR tests done by people flying into the country, uh, positivity rate of 0.8, while at the very same time, same period, same test, PCR testing, positivity rate in the general community over 8 percent, 8.3, 8.4 percent. So, uh, you know, I, I repeat what I say, based on all of the data available in the UK, these measures are excessive and I'd like to think they will be re reviewed and removed as quickly as possible. OK, um, we've been talking a lot about uh, passenger, the passenger business. Um, we have a question that's more uh, looking towards the cargo area. Um, and there's been a lot of news recently on inflation, supply chain disruption, um, et cetera. Given that uh, the, at least half of the cargo that's transported by air goes in the belly of uh, passenger aircraft, um, what do you think the impact of these new travel restrictions or the approach to uh, Omicron will have on the supply chain issues that the, the world is facing? Yeah, they're certainly going, not going to improve them. Um, so. Maybe just to explain, so traditionally we say it's about 50-50, 50% in belly hold, 50% in freighters. Uh, you know, that that has switched. Uh, we're probably at about 60-40 now, 60% in freighters, 40% in belly hold. And, uh, you know, the reason costs have gone up, in, in many cases the, the belly hold capacity is being provided by uh, passenger aircraft with no passengers. So, you know, traditionally, uh, what airlines often looked to was what the incremental cost of carrying the cargo was, uh, given that, you know, the uh, most of the cost was uh, borne by the fact that they were transporting passengers and then, uh, you know, the freight was uh, incremental and principally it was incremental weight. So there was often a case of, you know, you just looked at the incremental cost of the fuel. Uh, now you have a situation where some of this uh, belly hole capacity is on passenger aircraft, uh, but there are no passengers. So now all of the fuel uh, must be paid for uh, by the uh, the cargo, all of the landing fees, the en route charges. So it's a completely different dynamic. And, uh, you know, while some freight rates have, uh, air cargo rates have increased, uh, so have the costs associated with uh, shipping cargo. Uh, so uh, once you get disruption to long haul international travel, uh, you're likely to see less um, uh, belly hole capacity being made available. Uh, I, I think airlines, as I say, deserve great credit for actually continuing to support global supply chains by pivoting their business to carry cargo on board their passenger aircraft. And in some cases, uh, you've seen you know air passenger aircraft reconfigured to enable uh, airlines to carry some uh, cargo in the passenger cabin of the aircraft, removing the seats and uh, being able to transport uh, certain types of uh, products. So uh, it's a it's a very challenging environment at the moment, and uh, the uh, restrictions on international uh, cross border uh, traffic is certainly going to add to the the, the challenge that. Uh, uh, we've seen in terms of the supply chain. Um, and uh, I think that's something that uh, governments need to appreciate. Plus, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you know, restrictions on crew crossing borders. Uh, and you've seen some of the stories uh, about, you know, crew having to uh, be forced into uh, isolation um, has created problems there as well. So definite challenges in the supply chain. OK, thank you. Um, as we're coming close to the top of the hour, um, we've got a, a few more questions. We'll take a couple more, uh, maybe one's looking more towards the future. So um, one questioner asks uh, if the current restrictions will put off the uh, long-term prognosis for the industry recover, recovery perhaps beyond 2024, or do you think this is a short-term blip? No, I still think this is short term. I, I don't think it's going to uh, impact on the longer term forecast that we have looked at. OK, um, and then maybe this will be the last question, uh, which is saying at the end of a very challenging, second very challenging year of the pandemic, um, what are your hopes for 2022? <laughs> well, I, I hope that we see a, a more coordinated approach from governments. I hope that we see decisions based on data, based on uh, science based on fact rather than uh, politics. Uh, I hope we see 
greater uh, cooperation to enable people to get back um, and be able to travel, uh, be able to take sensible decisions as to whether they want to travel or not. And, and I hope uh, governments and competition regulators step in and stop consumers being ripped off by these uh, excessive prices for uh, testing. Uh, I think that's it's been a disgrace that governments have actually allowed that to happen and in some cases effectively promoted it, uh, you know, all in the name of protecting uh, health. Uh, so I, I think that's something that we do really need to look into and understand how that was allowed to happen and where has all the money gone. So, um, you know, let, let's just hope that uh, we learn from all the mistakes that were made. We, we learn from all the good things that were done uh, and we continue to uh, pay homage to the, the scientists who have developed vaccines and hopefully will develop uh, new drugs to assist in the treatment of people who catch these viruses and uh, hopefully uh, you know new drugs that uh, will help people um, you know to avoid catching uh, these viruses so let's all look to a you know a better 2022 than we've had in uh, 2021. Great. Um, thanks very much, Willie. I think with that, um, we'll close this briefing. So thank you to everyone uh, for their participation. Um, this will probably be the last briefing for uh, 2021. Um, so a big thank you to uh, everyone for following us through this year. It's been certainly an eventful one. Um, we will continue to, to be as open as we can uh, in 2022 with the media to uh, make sure that you understand uh, how IAT is approaching um, these issues. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have lots to, to talk about in the new year. Um, Willie, did you have any closing comments? No, just to thank you all again for, for joining us and look forward to uh, talking to you at some stage early in 2022. Thank you.